the old I think we should legendary podcast. Retitle it first reading podcast podcast. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament lectionary podcast for preachers and for everybody who loves the Hebrew Scriptures. I'm Rachel Wren. And I'm Tim McNinch. In just a few weeks, we'll have one of our long-form episodes, a sort of giant Clydesdale of an episode. But for now, we have another of our mini episodes, uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, pygmy horse type of episode in comparison, featuring the one and only Rachel Wren. This week, uh, we are diving into Jeremiah 18, 1 through 11, which is the first reading for September 8th. So Rachel, what do you have for us this week? Yeah, well, we got quite a a text, that's for sure. And it's quite a text that could produce quite a sermon that uh, maybe what some people in your congregation really need to hear. But it won't become clear what that sermon might be until we get to the end of the text for today. So just bear with me until we get there. This chapter is in many ways a riff on Jeremiah 1. Or if you think Jeremiah 1 was written as an introduction to the book of Jeremiah, as some scholars do, then it was a riff on this chapter. Hmm. But regardless of how you think the two chapters relate, relate they do, and in ways that plunge us immediately into the text. In verse 2, God tells Jeremiah to go to the house of the potter, which in Hebrew is a yotzer. Now, yotzer shares the same root as the Hebrew word to form, to make, to mold, which makes sense. The verb is to mold. The noun is a molder, which we call a potter. But what's interesting is it's one of the very first words God says to Jeremiah ever. Way back in chapter 1, verse 5, it says the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And that's essentially before I yotzered you in the womb, I knew you. So right off the bat in chapter 18, we're meant to hear God's very first conversation with Jeremiah in chapter one, where God commissions Jeremiah to the prophetic office. This might suggest that what we're about to hear is of a similar significance in the relationship between the prophet and divine. It's sort of a a hinge or an important point in this story. For it is there at the house of the potter where God says, I will make you hear my word to Jeremiah. This is a really emphatic statement. NRSV softens it a little bit and says, I will let you hear my word. And JPS kind of soothingly says, I will impart my words to you. But the verbal form of this word is pretty clear. God will not just allow Jeremiah to hear something. God will make the hearing unavoidable. Then in verse 7, we have a series of verbs that God sort of owns as divine sovereign right. Natash, to pluck up. Natatz, to break down, and avad, to uproot, to pull down, to destroy. Now, natash is something you use for plants, which makes sense. You uproot something that has been planted. Natatz, to break down, is more often in the Bible used for houses, for temples, for structures. And avad can be used for things that are just lost, but also for things that are utterly destroyed. So this is a a realm of destruction that covers things that have been planted, things that have been built, or just things that are in existence. And these three verbs, these three actions of destruction, are claimed within the right of the divine creator, namely to destroy that which the divine one has created. And they're also the same verbs that God used to commission Jeremiah as a prophet in chapter 1, which we talked about a few weeks back with Dr. Brent Strawn. In Jeremiah 1.10, God says to Jeremiah, See, I appoint you this day over nations and kingdoms. The same object over which God is claiming these powers here in chapter 18, by the way. God continues, I appoint you to uproot, Natash, and to pull down, Natatz, to destroy, Avad, and then he adds one more, to overthrow. All of these God declares in this text are my actions, my divine right. But then in verse 8, God also claims a divine right to the action of mercy, the ability to change the sovereign plan to compassion instead of destruction in the face of a nation's repentance. Or as we hear in verses 9 to 10, the inverse is also true. God may first choose to build up and plant a nation, same words to use to commission Jeremiah in chapter 1, Bana and Nata. 
But then God may shift course in the face of that nation's displeasing actions and lack of obedience. These are all actions within the realm of divine possibility. And then in verse 11, God moves from possibility to reality. Now say to the men of Judah, God says, and to the dwellers of Jerusalem, I am forming, again, Yotzer, disaster for you and laying out plans against you because, the implication goes, your behavior has been displeasing and you have not been obedient. But this is not just divine shouting. This is no heavenly posturing. This is pleading. In this same verse, God continues, turn back, and then he uses the word na, which is a really tough Hebrew word to translate, but it's often used when a person of inferior status is speaking out of respect or out of pleading to a person of superior status. Here, God, the superior one, takes that word, na, and throws it at the Israelites and pleads with them, turn back from your wicked ways. Amend your ways, the NRSV records this plea, and the JPS says, mend your ways. But they're missing a really rich Hebrew word here, yatav. This is the verbal form of the word tov, which means good. Tov, or good, is the same word used in Genesis 1 when God looks at creation every few days and says, oh, tov, that's good. And then on the last day, God looks at everything and says, oh, tov ma'od, which means very good. Tov can mean good, it can mean beautiful, it can even mean right. God is not just asking people to amend or mend things. God's not just asking people to fix things. God is saying, beautify your ways, rightify them, goodify your actions. If so, we can change together the impending disaster. If not, we slip ever closer to the day when my mind and my heart will choose not to build and to plant, but instead to uproot and destroy. Now, one could write a very nice moral sermon in this text on the call to good living. And the the text seems to lay this out. That could even be a necessary sermon considering, considering our current political climate. What would it look like to beautify your ways and your actions? What would you stop sharing on Facebook? What would you stop saying behind your hand? What would you stop doing? But there's one more little piece to this text, and it's left off by the lectionary, and perhaps it's because it's heartbreaking. In the very next verse, verse 12, God finishes this account of the divine plea to Israel by saying, but they will say, it is no use. We will keep on following our plans. Each of us will act according to the stubbornness of our evil will. The Hebrew word here that is translated as, is it, it is no use, is a form of the verb ya'ash, meaning to be desperate or to despair. So in response to the divine pleading, to the heavenly olive branch, to the imploring of God Almighty to change their ways and avoid disaster, the only thing that people can do is cry, despair. It's not clear why. Are the people calling God's bluff? Or is there almost an awareness here of the futility of humans to pull ourselves away from the thing that seduces us the most, namely our own will? It's a moment of raw honesty, almost like a glimmer of wisdom in an otherwise festering pool of self-indulgence. It's one that leads us to want God to relent, to have compassion, to give mercy. But God's history with this people, as the book of Jeremiah shows, and probably, if we're honest, God's history with us, leads us all to know that you give us, any of us, an inch with our favorite compulsion, and we will take more than a mile. It is this quality of humanity, this stubbornness of our own evil will, that leads God to drastic action. Here in Jeremiah, That drastic action is letting the full brunt of the consequences of evil actions fall upon the people themselves. And sometimes we need that. Ask any recovering alcoholic or addict about what finally made them stop, and you'll often hear a similar phrase, rock bottom. That moment when the full brunt of the consequences of your actions falls upon your head and there's nowhere left to hide. In Lutheran speak, we would call that the law. 
But sometimes the law functions as grace in that when the full brunt of those consequences do fall on your head, you finally get to stop running. You finally get to stop hiding. You get to stop responding to the pleas of the people you love only with cries of despair. In the New Testament, of course, the ultimate drastic action of God is taken in Christ Jesus, which is to take those full brunt of the consequences of our actions, past, present, and future, upon the divine body itself, to bear them and to die. This is a tough text. It's a raw text. But it may be a word that people in your congregation are really thirsting to hear. Yeah, that's so helpful, Rachel. I really appreciate that you pushed us past the sort of uh, surface level moralistic interpretation of this, which I find is so easy to do in the prophets in general. Mm-hmm. I, I think it helps when we see that the even the institution of prophecy as we have it in scripture is is a divine move of grace of mercy Mm -hmm. if if it was all just um of no use if that despair was was truly the only option then it would be pointless to send prophets at all so even even prophets with a message of destruction and uh, judgment are sent uh, out of mercy in order to provoke a change of heart in the people Mm -hmm. So I I really appreciate that you brought that point out so well. Thanks. Well, that should wrap us up for this week, dear listeners. If you want to catch up on back episodes of First Reading, check out our website, firstreadingpodcast.com. And make sure that you take a couple minutes to subscribe to the podcast feed on iTunes or wherever you like to get your podcasts. That way you'll get new episodes each week as soon as they drop. Until next time, I'm Tim McNinch. And I'm Rachel Wren. Happy preaching. Oh, man. I had a frog in my throat that whole time. I can tell you it worked.